Welcome, friends. Uh, sorry we're starting a little late, but this is now the home stretch and the prime time for the Goa Arts and Literature Festival. And I'm so pleased with this particular session and also um, the way the festival has gone. It's been very rich. We've had people from uh, audiences are also getting tired, but we have hundreds of people watching on uh, live stream also. And when we uh, start, started thinking about this festival of the year, of, of, when we started thinking about this festival this year, I had four or five books in mind, which I myself considered to be the books of the year. Um, and after a long time, Indian writing has, has uh, been living up to the hype. Um, Indian, uh, Indian writing was kind of a, has been a flavor, a global flavor for a long time. But now I think that the world of publishing, the world of readers, um, the translations, the robust uh, print uh, culture in different parts of the country, uh, we're starting to be what we're supposed to be. Um, and amazingly, at this time, we have a new generation of novelists who are again punching way the way that we should be. I mean, uh, punching may be the wrong word here, but certainly representing India the way they should be, uh, that we should be. And I'm so pleased that we have two of the authors of the two possibly finest novelists of the uh, novels of the year, uh, Devika Rege and Anjum Hassan with us. Please join us, join uh, us on stage, Devika and Anjum. So Quarter Life is Devika's first novel, and it's just won a major prize. And Anjum Hassan is not uh, no stranger to the Goa Arts and Literature Festival, where she's read poetry yesterday, and she's come with several of her other books. But this book in particular is a huge success. So congratulations to both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for agreeing to be in conversation with, uh, with each other in kind of an unusual format. Much appreciated. Over to you. OK, thank you, Vivek. Um, when Vivek suggested that Devika and I uh, be in conversation, we were both unsurprised. And the reason is that our books came out at about the same time last year. Hers came out in June, mine came out in August. And almost from the word go, uh, reviewers, publishers also uh, in conversation, certainly LitFest organizers have thought it appropriate to bring us into this arranged marriage. Uh, and we've been together ever since. Yeah. And now that we've so got well. to know each other <laughs> a little better and have read each other's books, we've decided we're not unhappy in this sort of, um, yeah, I wouldn't say forced matrimony, but engineered matrimony. And the reason is that we have both apparently written state of the nation novels. How do we do that? I, don't, I, I certainly didn't think I was setting out to write a state of the nation novel or a Modi years novel. Uh, of course, I was writing a, what I hope would be read as a very contemporary book because it's about a school teacher of history in Delhi. He lives in Old Delhi, he lives in Darya Ganj. Um, and he's a pretty innocuous character or would have been at another time in India's history because he's just doing his job. Uh, but given everything around him, Given the kind of city Delhi is becoming, given the way people's minds are turning, given how even the children in his class uh, are not always with him on what sort of history they want to learn, he immediately becomes, a, um, if not controversial, at least someone who seems to be going against the grain. So that very briefly is, is my novel. Devika's is set a little before mine. Mine is set... Um, just before uh, the protests against the CAA, and the CAA protests are like sort of being beamed on television uh, late in the novel, and then, and then we know what happened after that in Delhi, and the novel ends with the spirit of the times in the background. And Devika's is set in 2014, and it's a questions that have come, you know, come out of comparing these books. And... I, you know, in this day of kind of reviews and awards and things like that, they almost make it seem like it's some kind of booky book world. But the truth is, we write our times together. You know, these are uh, things done in, in, in solidarity without knowing it. Anjun was writing her book for years, and so was I. And now on the other side, it's just wonderful to see 
or to ask oneself why a sort of Modi era book, uh, if at all we can call it that, took that much time. Um, what were the kind of uh, ideas that were brewing in parallel, whose time had come and expressed itself in these two different forms, where they diverge, where they converge. Um, for example, one of the moderators at another lit fest, a young Muslim lady uh, for my book asked me, she said, you know, I uh, read your book and I read Anjum's book and I'm very curious about the fact that both of y'all have decided to give voice and perspective uh, to the, the liberal Muslim to sort of foreground this character as opposed to, you know, the devout one. And I thought that that was an interesting question. And if it was my book alone, it generates one kind of interest. But if both of us have arrived at that, it does make me wonder sort of what brought us to that or how you feel about if you have come across this, I won't call it criticism necessarily, but this observation kind of what your feelings are about something like that. I think it's very hard to write about devout anything because it sort of would probably end on the first page <laughs> because you, we know what the devout is about. And of course, I'm not saying that the inner life of a spiritually inclined person or a believer is uninteresting. It's just, um, it's actually much harder to describe in a form as discursive as a novel and be uh, from the opposite end, it could also be, yeah, it could also be the obvious, right? And I think the reason why my character is, is liberal, is a liberal, he happens to be Muslim. I think of him more as a liberal Indian. He's really a, a liberal Indian of a certain stripe who happens to be Muslim. Yes. And for me, I think we, we tie everything to politics all the time and we're doing it more and more and it's making me more and more impatient, I think, because um, liberalism to me is not just what you believe in and where you are on the spectrum. It's also a style. It's a certain confidence in your own view of the world, in individuality, in not having to throw in your lot with anything. It's a tentative certainty. That's what liberalism is for me. And it doesn't matter who you voted for or what you think about anything in the political realm. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of character, those are the kind of characters I tend to write. And I should stop because, <laughs> because uh, it would be interesting to explore people who are not so obviously liberal. But it's, I want to try and do it maybe in, in, in the novel I write next because it is really a challenge to write Somebody who's not thinking all the time and is not self-aware and is not questioning the world around him. Uh, but I just, I just love the idea of this confidence in style. And the novel, I think, is a form that would fall if its characters were not open-minded. I mean, what would they be talking about, Devika? And your characters are talking all the time, so you tell me. Um. So I did get started on the novel with a similar assumption about... Um, about the kind of characters I would like to write. And so my opening three characters are, in fact, all, all liberal. Um, and then as the novel kind of, as my own research on the novel expanded, I grew more and more fascinated with, well, one of the things that I was doing was finding out how young men in right-wing youth groups think. And I was particularly struck by those of them who were there for reasons of um, political expediency, like just being relevant and, and sort of rising with the powers that be of the day. And those who are actually devout, like they actually sincerely with a kind of crusader's energy believed in this, in this dream and this project, in these gods. And I do think sometimes that by thinking of whether it's the right wing, whether it's the devout, whether it's the conservative, in thinking of them as a monolith, you almost give them more power. And so it's very important to press uh, on what the fault lines might be and what the fissures might be and why, you know, say why the Shiv Sena and BJP made uncomfortable bedfellows when they did, even though they were all waving saffron flags. And again, I don't want to kind of draw this back to politics, but um, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you, you know, that the novelist usually has a liberal temper. And you have some interesting devout characters in your book as well. Like I was very intrigued by the fact that Ankit, the young boy, almost seems predisposed to a certain kind of behavior from childhood, whereas someone like Emma is a product of his circumstances, which brings up that question of just, 
you know, is there something, is it nature or nurture that results in a man taking to a certain kind of, I mean, devout is the wrong word, but like a certain kind of extreme position. Um, but I think there is something about, the, you know, there's something about the, the novelist that's inescapably a liberal mind. And I, and I wonder if that's the greatest autobiographical trace we leave through our works. Even if characters are necessarily devout, the novel is a kind of liberal form. And there's everything about that form that's, you know, that reflects the best of a certain kind of liberal order where we believed in all these things, right? In, in pluralism, in, uh, you know, in humanism. But then there's also all, all the stuff that, that was part of that order, like all the economic stuff that got us in the trouble that we are now. And so sometimes I, um, sometimes my book feels like a lament for liberalism, and I feel that very much about your book as well. But there's also this kind of discomfort with some aspects of, of that. Well, it is about an anachronism, I think, my book. I think Aleph is very passe in some ways, even though he's very alive and responding to things in the moment. And one hopes that the reader stays with him and doesn't feel that, you know, there's nothing in here for me. You know, I, I, I want Aleph to be recognizable immediately in certain ways, while maybe... Uh, reminding us of ways of thinking that are, ah, yes, going out of fashion. And to me, I think the critical thing is how do we relate to the culture? It, it goes back to what you're saying about the Shiv Sena and the uh, BJP in, in Maharashtra, and you have a character called Omkar who has a very, no, I mean, the word would be nuanced, right? He's the product of a particular kind of sidelining or uh, feeling on the back foot. And so he invests in certain a certain mythology uh, to do with Marathi pride or Mar Marathi maleness or Marathi character, right? Um, so to me, like this, and you, your characters are doing it much more overtly than mine. Um, what happens when we, we're unsure of who we are and then we try and reach into something, some, some bucket somewhere to pull out some symbols that we can wear as markers of who we are? And I think Aleph is, he just doesn't want to do that. You know, he, of course, he's a, he knows he's a historian or a would-be historian. And of course, he's aware that we are shaped by forces all the time. And I'll give you an example in relation to this specific thing called Muslim culture that he would be seen as coming out of. And so he lives in Old Delhi and he walks almost every evening to sit on the, on the steps of the Jama Masjid. He lives in a house from where he can see the minarets and he knows that he has grown up here, he's going to die here within view of the mosque. So that is culture, yes, he's, he, he identifies with something there. But he doesn't like the fact that there are all these day trippers coming to look at the ruins of Old Delhi and there are heritage walks and they are, there is this fetishization of the crumbling quality of that place. He feels that if that is going to be the way it's looked at, then he himself is a, is a specimen. So, you know, that kind of externalization of culture, at the same time, he has relatives who live in Meroli, the opposite end of Delhi. And it's like the very well, the best known thing there is the Kutub Minar, but there are also lots of other ruins. And there are people there in his extended family or even in the community who I describe as sort of wanderers among the ruins. And these are not tourists. These are people who have grown up here and they have they are they're full of half-baked ideas about what this what this history is. I mean, most of them don't know the facts at all. Right? So He's more tolerant of that. He's more tolerant of a people whose moment is past. It's obviously gone, right? And they're living there and they're thinking things like, this was great once, so we can live off it. And he feels a certain empathy with that, but he doesn't feel an empathy with this externalized, glamorized uh, culture of nostalgia for this pretty moth-eaten thing now called Muslim culture. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's one of my, my favorite things about Aleph as a character, that he constantly, you know, you see all, the, you see all those tropes, and yet he's, constant, he's kind, of kind of living in them and also resisting them at the same time. And this is something that some of the characters in my book have also got, you know, they've got described in this way. 
you know, are they archetypes? Are they allegorical? That's at its best. At its worst, are they stereotypes, like or, or mouthpieces of a certain kind of? And I mean, I think when we take on books like this, where I don't think it's it's naive. I think we're aware of what we're doing because you know, even on the book jacket, you have the fact it's not just describing Aleph. It does say in a time when Muslims are, you know. So I think. Um, I don't think that, uh, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't think that I was unaware of what I was quoting while writing the book. But I do have quite an interest in these stereotypes. Um, and the reason is because stereotypes make someone hypervisible and invisible at the same time. Right? You're seen through one lens, and all the registers, and all the complexity, and all the nuances that comprise you are smashed. And it, uh, ideology is working at its best when people are seen in the form of stereotypes. And so what is it to write a novel that is going to confront these things, is going to locate this character you know, in this place, and yet somehow collapse what people would otherwise sort of see him as. And I think that's, to me, one of the, the triumphs of your book and something that I really enjoyed reading about it. But um, I would be curious about how, it's funny how the life, you know, kind of life follows art sometimes. We as writers, in a way, are living what our characters are living, which is, uh, you know, being seen as, either a report card on Modi's India or a voice for Muslim India or like books on India. Like how have you felt about that, about being seen in that light, about the book being seen in that way, marketed in that way, received in that way? Um, yeah. But I'm just making a mental note to respond to your point about stereotypes because I don't think your characters are stereotypes at all. But I'll come to that. I'll just, um, yeah, talk about this Modi years thing, which again, like I said, I find it a little annoying because why should a novel be tied to who happens to be sitting in the prime minister's chair? It seems like, it seems strange to me. Uh, but at the same time, of course, I know that it's more than a man sitting in the prime minister's chair. It, again, it's a culture, right? And you are responding to something that's going on in the minds of people because of, you know, so again, it's it's an it's a, if not a stereotype, it is it is symbolic of something larger, say. But to me, again, like drawing on the tradition of the novel, the most interesting novels about dark times are the ones that don't address the darkness directly. You know, it's just it's just in the air, it's in the atmosphere. But what you're really looking at is how are uh, the characters corrupted or divided because the big guys and the bad men are obviously what they are. We don't need to take them down uh, in any straightforward way at all. I think if you're writing about, I mean, look at the novels of the lost, what is called the lost generation, right, in the US. They were at that period, early 20th century America, in a culture that's not dissimilar to ours, very materialistic, sense of spiritual emptiness. And what did that produce? It produced Scott Fitzgerald. It produced Hemingway. It produced uh, Don Passos. And I don't recall reading in any of those books any direct critique of American politics. You have characters who are themselves a reflection of their times, right? So I don't see it as all the bad politics on one side and these besieged liberal characters on the other, because I think Aleph, him, Aleph is also a flawed character in some ways. If he, if he didn't live in uh, the India that we do in, I think he, he, so to come back to the word I used earlier, a more confident character, he's not. He doesn't respond to things in a resolute way. He's very, um, he's a wimp in many ways. He doesn't take strong stands, he lives in his head, uh, and these are. This is a reflection of the times for me. This is Modi's India, but also the domain of the novel, right? And that you focus on the common man. Like even though people have talked about Quarter Life being a book about politics, there's no politicians in it per se. You know, there's no. I mean, there, there are scenes where they appear as peripheral, peripheral characters, but the sort of the psychological drama is all sort of everyday citizens, and it's been played out there, which is a profoundly morally ambivalent space. It's much. Uh, you know, it, most common citizens would have a certain a certain register. Um, but to respond to the thing about stereotypes in your characters, I think, like I said, to me, it's a novel about being young in India, 
And as I'm reading, I'm thinking, is this what it is to be young today? It seems like so much work <laughs> because the characters are, are so... Um, so I call liberalism uh, a tentative certainty when I started talking, right? I said to me, it's, that's the space in which a character like Aleph. But I think your characters don't have those certainties. You know, they, for instance, you have this Wharton school. I think he's gone to some big business school in the US, your character Narain. And early in the novel, he's feeling very alienated. He's not sure what he's doing in the, in the States. And he, can I give that away? Just the first, yeah. So he, he's, he's, he goes back to his apartment. He's on, uh, I think he's on antidepressants and he's, Immediately, you know, you're in the presence of a very anxious soul and he walk. It's winter. He walks past a bridge and he, he, he continues past that bridge and he goes, sits in a cafe, I think. And he says, of course, I wouldn't have jumped. And then you realize he was, he was considering it. But very soon after he's in an airport with a friend and they're going back to India and he's incredibly buoyant. And he's talking about the opportunities that the new government has opened out for young Indians to come back for and the things you can do in business. And I'm like, is this the same guy who's going to jump off the bridge just now? But and because certainty, well, anxiety and certainty of political opinion are not unyoked. You know, an insecurity and a great surety in one's political, personal insecurity and a great surety in one's political position are not unyoked. Um, I forget which is that line from Yeats where he says kind of, um, which is the poem, in the nightmare of the dark, all the dogs of Europe park. Basically where the, uh, he calls it good men, I hope not, but they're confused and they're silent. And, and kind of those who, uh, you know, have least moral certitude or, or sort of those who are, um, who are perhaps most insecure and most, you know, they're the ones who are oiling for blood. And I think, and I, I don't want to boil it down to only Narain, but the first chapter of the novel is called Anxiety. And all of those characters are full of anxiety, which is almost in complete contrast to how strong and thick their political opinions become as the book progresses. And so that is, um, but I wanted to talk about another, another aspect of your book that I, I really, really enjoyed, which was the structure. And uh, both books are discursive. And in Anjum's book, uh, there's of course Aleph, who is the main protagonist who leads the book. Um, if, if that sounds like an okay reading, I don't know. Uh, and, and of course, what's happening in his life as a school teacher, which is that a, a young Hindu boy has kind of, they've, they've got into a scrap and the school, which is becoming incre increasingly culturally Hindu is siding with the boy. Um, that's sort of, you know, that's the line running through the novel, but around that it's, it's wonderfully discursive. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the novel and all the debates on history that have been brought in and, and, and all the kind of moments of change in Delhi that have been captured. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about what sort of, what motivated that structure and uh, what you think about, um, you know, what you think about that kind of storytelling and the way it's been received and your intention. Well, I, I think I'm very old school about writing novels still. I mean, I'm, I'm still with Chekhov. If there's a gun introduced, it has to go off. And there should be a gun. Otherwise, it's not fun. So um, I, I, I want drama when I'm reading fiction and I want drama when I'm writing fiction. So I want stuff to be going on apart from all the wonderful daydreams that Aleph, ineffective daydreams and all his conversations and all of that. There has to be an engine driving thing, things uh, for the characters and there has to be something at stake. Right. You know, unless there's something at stake, even if it's a simple a thing as Aleph being able to hang on to his job or his wife getting the house that she's looking for or their marriage not falling apart, like everyday stuff. But unless there's something at stake, you can't, I don't think you can ensure a reader's interest. I certainly wouldn't know why I'm writing. Uh, and I know what you're saying. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like my favorite part was the drama of thought, which is also a kind of drama. And I like that, you know, the drama of action in the book could have been 100 pages, or, you know, and it's not, and that's the best part about it, that it is, it is how his thinking is evolving, it's how the thinking of the people around him is evolving. But maybe that's my reading. I don't know what others, what others. Yeah, but to me, okay, so maybe, maybe 
I didn't put it well. So when I say drama, it's not just technique, right? The gun analogy maybe suggested, but drama is also the drama of life, yeah. right? So when you when you're reading Dostoevsky, yeah. when you're reading Brothers Karamaz Karamazov, um, which is what novel could be more conversational than that? Very much so. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so much stuff going on that's not external drama. Yes. It's, it's intrinsic to the characters' lives that a father and son are in love with the same woman. Yeah. Uh, old priest is dying and trying to pass on the mantle to a younger guy. Uh, there's a very poor, and I read the novel ages ago, so I'm making things up probably. But there's this officer figure who's very humiliated but trying to keep yeah. his dignity. All these things going on, there are people jumping out of windows, there's... Yeah, like people better. jumping out of windows in the middle of a conversation, there are yeah. fights, there's blood. Yeah. So I think, and that's, that's life in Russia at that time for him. Mm -hmm. Or that's, that's, that's the flesh and the blood of the characters. It's not just drama as, okay, we need, we need them to, to be doing something while they're talking about the really important stuff. To me, I agree, okay, yeah. I, I'm happy that we're disagreeing about this. Now <laughs> we're... <laughs> Now I'm getting interesting. <laughs> really um, interesting. Yeah, I no my re my reaction to the brothers Karamazov was quite the opposite. I mean, these two things have to be welded. You have to have the drama of thought and action, but not least because that's how they play out in life, right? They're not divorced from each other, and a good novel encompasses both. Uh, and I, you know, I don't want to have some ghostly figure walking, unnamed kind of narrator walking through the book and just thinking thoughts. Though Teju Cole's Open City is a great great yeah, book, one. you know. So those that's things. But yeah, I think when I think back to the brothers Karamazov, it is the it is the allegorical positions that each of those brothers occupy that I remember most strongly, and the kind of debates between them. I mean, without that, it would fall apart much sooner than if Lizaveta wasn't maybe for me a character in the book. But but this does bring me to a kind of deeper question in terms of what 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 brings the reader back to the page, because when when I was in writing school, they often you use the term engine. And the engine presents this picture of like this, this one thing powering forward and like all these little kind of bogies following. And usually the engine, at least again when I was in school, was either a, a facet of the plot or it was a central protagonist. But there are so many books that defy that logic. Like for example, Naipaul's In a Free State or more recently, Siddharth Dev's The Light at the End of the World. These are books that work like montages, almost like a cinematic montage where you have four completely almost disparate stories, but they are linked thematically. And it's, the, it's those thematic links that kind of drive your interest in the novel. Or if you look at Proust, uh, Swan's Way, you know, he spends eight, the, eight, the first 80 pages of that book just getting out of bed, you know? And uh, what keeps you coming back is the language and the sensibility. And I took some, I don't know, three years to, I'm, I'm still only a book and a half into Proust. But I feel it's like a lifetime project. I read 30, 40 pages, and then I'm done. And of course, there's no plot you're going back for. So then you forget about it a few months. But then you really you miss him. You know, you miss the voice. You feel like being steeped in it again. And so you go back and you proceed. And that's also, and yet it's a great novel. Uh, Moby Dick. I just shudder to think what modern day editors would do to it. You know, um, what is the value of an entire chapter on the whiteness of the whale? And yet, what is that book without 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 sort of almost being shaped like a whale. And so, I don't know, like that, that elusive question of what keeps bringing the reader back. So, you, yeah, yeah. But, but when I said engine, uh, I, of course I did mean, I did mean drama, but it, drama is also, like I said, about what is at stake. That I agree. To me, it's yeah. very, yeah, it's very important that <laughs> the characters are reaching for something and you're reading because, of course you're reading for language. That's that's indisputable. Yeah. I mean, how, I, I, neither of us could read a book if... Oh, yes. I mean, all these elements are there in all good books, but I'm just wondering about different ones get privileged in different books, In different right? ways. And I think but, I'm leaning on the other side yeah. simply because I'm often accused of writing books where nothing happens. Oh, no. And, and, and Anjum, it's very may you always. Like. No, no, no. I think <laughs> it's that? interesting because uh, it, says, it says a lot of things. Uh, yeah, it says that they're boring books, which I'm okay Don't with. Listen. Uh, Don't listen. Don't listen. But but it's often like nothing happens. But it's well written and it's quiet and and I think. But wait, no, it's just like what you said. It's there is a design, and if you haven't seen it, 
Uh, that is to me, everything there is related to the things that you value. Language, um, pause, uh, ellipses, taking time off to describe the whiteness of a whale. It's all there. But it, to me, it has to hang together somehow. And yeah, there has to be that thing in front that's, lead, that's leading it. But like you mentioned, Tejuko's Open City, I would consider that one novel the, the, the biggest influence on this book. Really? Yes. Wow. Because it's just about a man walking in a city. Yeah. I love that book. Yeah. And, um, but what is, what is the engine of that book? It's the man walking in the city. Um, okay, so yeah, we don't know, it's not, he, he's clearly not, he's clearly not saving a failing marriage or um, going to lose his job and doesn't know what, you know, yeah. but what I'm saying, what, what I mean there is the consciousness of one man yeah. relating to his city, that's Alif. And that's the drama of thought that I love about your book, so may you never change that about your style. You know, um, that's for me the triumph of the book. And uh, no, so in that yeah. sense, in the sense that that expansiveness, the luxury of thought. And that is the joy of the novel. Yeah. It, I mean, this is such a, it's such a vast form, and I think one recognizes that only when you sit down to write one, right? It's bigger than any symphony or any, the canvas of, of so much language over so many pages. Um, it's, it's sort of staggering. And it's, uh, the question is almost when, when a form is so wide, how do you know when it's failed? And uh, I don't know, what would, your, what would your answer be to that? Um, I certainly can't tell about my own books. Um, <laughs> but yours is very interesting, I think, uh, just for that reason that the characters are constantly trying to decide where or what to throw in their lot with. And it seems as if they don't want to quite decide that that constant anxiety about, again, so to give another example, Rohit is a character of yours who hasn't done that American dream thing, right? He stayed back home. He's very, very confident, it seems. And there's a scene where he's feeling on top of the world. He says that, you know, his, he started a new thing, a venture that's doing well. His family is very supportive. And he says that never in his life has he felt this loved. And he's almost like whooping with joy. But a few pages later, he's hit rock bottom already. And again, I'm like how I, at the brittleness of a young person's consciousness is a very unusual thing to me. I, I must be old because it's, it's, it's making me dizzy. So, but you were obviously doing this. I mean, I, well, just to link it to our previous line of thought, I never saw the book as having only one engine. It almost felt like a kind of cavalcade that's racing forward and how do you kind of, you know, get all those horses to move together. Um, and so for me, really, you know, you have all these characters, they're going through, um, you know, they're going through all that they're going through. And what, if one has to use the word engine, it's, it's probably the thematic unity between what, you know, and the way each of those threads is tying into a certain moment. And there's also a kind of structural conceit to the overarching work. You know, it goes from three voices to nine to almost 40, and it's asking all these questions about you know, kind of about representation and about who, you know, again, to go back to the beginning of our, of our discussion. And, uh, you know, and there are some people who have felt, some readers who have felt completely unanchored in the book and been unable to continue reading because they're like, I need one character, I need one story. But there are others who loved it because they were reading for something else. Um, I but one character, one story, but I wish, oh, I, I sometimes <laughs> wish that, because so I'm, I'm with Rohit when he's yeah. so ecstatic, and I'm like, let's see how this plays out. Yeah. But he already changes his mind on the next page, or not literally the next page, but soon enough. No. And then I'm like, okay, now what do we do now? How do I, how do I stay with this guy? But uh, to go back, no, I think, uh, I think I see what you're doing with that. And I, I certainly think there will be many readers who recognize, recognize themselves in that instability. Yeah. But to me, one of the most interesting things about your book, I said it's about what it's to be young today in America. I think what it's to be young today in India. But I think it's also about 
what is it like to be seen through American eyes? Yeah. Very much. Oh, it's, rain, it's, yeah. it's very much about what is it like to be Indian in the American vision. Because your characters have either lived there, worked there, there are American characters in the book as well, which you've done wonderfully, I thought. Uh, and it's way more nuanced than the typical diaspora novel. It's incredibly advanced from there. It is not about the hardworking Indian who goes and makes it and either feels out of place or uh, too much at home. Uh, it's way more difficult to be an immigrant in America is what you seem to be saying because Narain is very, very if effective as a corporate whatever he is. And there's a lovely passage to me that things like that are like the heart of your book for me because he's talking about his career in this all white almost space and he was just brilliant at what he did. He aced everything. And then he realizes there's this sort of unwritten rule that as a brown person in the West or in America, you are not expected to better the whites. You are expected to be very good, to be uh, 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 fully sort of, um, to understand the game, mm. to do it well, but to stop at second best. Yeah. And to me, that was, that really, expanded the view of things. It's not that simple, you know, the reluctant fundamentalist. To me, it's that, that's a good no, novel. It's, but it's a, it's, a very, it's a very black and white novel, reluctant fundamentalist. It's the guy who buys the American myth and then halfway through the book, he completely uh, abandons it or turns his back on it. But your, your novel is saying it's not that simple for, for young people today who and you come back with that consciousness. You don't leave it. If, even if you come back, you're still American. Yeah. You're still half American and unhappy. But there is such a great desire to decolonize the mind. And kind of that, one sees that playing out through the rest of the book. Um, and that's something that I see around us all in India today. Like, yes, decolonization is a, you know, there's no doubt it's a really important uh, process. But I almost feel it's been co-opted in this strange way in the current climate where, you know, for example, you'll take the, you know, the IPC and you'll give it a Sanskrit name and then everybody's like, oh, yay, decolonization, when actually the, when actually the, the, the state has, has derived more power out of the rewriting and what could be more colonial than a police state. And so I think through the character of Narain, what I wanted to explore is the dark side of that desire to quash the white gaze. And, you know, and there's also, there's Amanda, there's a person on the other side of that gaze. And, and what happens when they are dehumanized. Like, does it liberate us? Does it set us free? So I think those were some of the um, the, the questions guiding that character. Uh, on which note, I have a final question since we've just got the sign to wrap up. You know, one of the, at the beginning of this conversation, one of the essays that came to mind was, uh, you know, we spoke about the books being read as allegorical of the nation. And I just wanted to come back to that. And uh, to recall Frederick Jameson, who talks of you know the novel as yeah the third world novel will always be a national allegory, and of course Ajaz Emma takes him down and you know the, you know essentializing the third world. But if we keep that aside, if we just see of the novel as potentially national allegory, and you know you see it with even the the, the great American novel and so on, I, I wanted to ask. We've been on panels before where we've been upset that our novels have been read this way, and I wondered if we could. <sighs> You know, the books also invite it. My editor told me that. He's like, you're complaining, but your novel also in some ways invites this and some of the choices that you've made, both in the novel and the way you've allowed it to be packaged. And to be very honest, if, we, if we're, two, we're women, 20 years ago, if we'd written this, I don't know what, it would have been read as domestic fiction. The fact that we're on a panel where our novels are being seen as state of the nation novels, like it, it, there's a kind of conflict within me that, um, well, and also the, the the enterprise of the novel has grown with the nation. And, and all of us as human beings, are, we, we live at the level of the local and the city and the regional and the national and the international. And, you know, and it's sad when only one of those registers is picked up, but to deny that they all exist in these novels and are in fact foregrounded in novels like this that are so aware of you know, them would also be a stretch. But how do you feel about that before we close? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be seen as a national allegory. You don't want your book to be seen as a national allegory because then everything seems 
to be about something else. And I don't want it to be read necessarily like that. Uh, it it takes away from the realism for me, and for, I'm I'm a, I'm a committed real, <laughs> committed realist. So I get anxious when we go back to that uh, Jameson way of looking. But you know, I said that the constant harking back to politics makes me impatient. But the fact is that I'm writing a novel about contemporary India with Indian characters who are talking about the nation all the time. Exactly. And so, how, how can I get away from that? It's a national hobby. And is that not realism? And so exactly. it's a national so, allegory, not what all of us so are it's also. Not, it's not level. an allegory. That's realism. Yeah, that we have all those registers. No, it's also the fact that no, no two people can talk, uh, can meet in India, apparently. And that's an exaggeration, but whatever. It's very much part of our social life to talk about politics, to yeah. talk about, the, and their character's doing. Okay, Vivek, Vivek is ascending is, the we, <laughs> we really have to stop now. Yeah, we're, we're getting more and more abstract, so Vivek is, um, yeah. So I think, I think the realism is also about just how do these people think? Yeah. And they're not just thinking of what, what's happening in their backyard, they're also thinking of why are we living in this country and what is it all about? Thank you, Vivek. <laughs> what? Stars of Indian literature. So proud of both of you. Thank you for on behalf of India. Oh my God! It's a joke. Thank you, though. But thank you so much. Please buy both of them. They're both available outside. And please keep your seats for the next session. Another big hand, please, for Anjum Hassan and Devika Rege. Thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful. By the way, I was, it was wonderful to hear you both mention Teju Cole because Anju may have been here, but his book was launched at Goa Arts and Literature Festival the first time outside uh, the United States. So something to be proud of and what a wonderful trajectory it's been. Yes, congratulations, congratulations. Please keep your seats for the next session, which will start almost immediately. It's very exciting. We are going to